what does the Bible say about infant baptism? As a good Southern Baptist, I'll say very little or nothing. <laughs> um, no, uh, so, so I would differentiate. I mean, what, you, what you're asking there is, uh, I'm assuming, the nature of baptizing babies. What is the nature then of baptism? What, does the, what do the scriptures have to say about baptism? And, uh, and so I would affirm that baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. Uh, what, what is sometimes called, uh, we believe in credo baptism or believer's baptism, that uh, the scriptures point to the reality that you are baptized after you are saved, uh, after you come to a, a saving knowledge, a saving understanding, a saving profession of faith, that you know who Christ is and you decide to follow him. And as a result of that, you then respond through baptism as Jesus commanded, uh, that uh, those would be saved and then baptized, right? Matthew 28, the Great Commission. The question then is what to do about this tradition of, uh, of baptism. Well, if, if that's our understanding of baptism, that it's, it's merely, or not just merely, but it is an ordinance, something we're commanded to do, but it is not saving it in, in and of itself. It's rather a reflection of saving faith. Um, there's still the question, okay, well, I grew up Catholic or maybe Presbyterian. I, for example, grew up Catholic. I was baptized in the Catholic Church. Um, where do we... How do we understand these things? Like, what kind of box do we put this in? There's lots of different avenues you could take that in terms of how do I approach my family then? I want to be baptized, but I was baptized as a kid. They feel kind of uh, maybe offended that I would get rebaptized, or maybe it's more of an intellectual debate. Well, is it in there or not? Uh, my understanding is it's, it's not explicitly expounded anywhere in Scripture. If you affirm it, particularly in a reform setting, uh, you're, you're looking at it more through kind of a covenant theology, a different particular kind of framework that you're then uh, forcing onto uh, New Testament texts and whatnot. So uh, I've rambled a little bit on it, but that's my general response. Any thoughts? My thought is Chris has got a great answer to the next question. I'm a, I'm a struggling Christian. I'm in love with my sin. Let me put this up there for you. And I want to feel bad about it, but sometimes I don't. I am a struggling Christian. I am in love with my sin. And I want to feel bad about it, but sometimes I don't. So a couple things. Uh, one, I don't think you're alone in this. Um, this is something that comes up in our community group often, in one-on-one -on -one discussions. I'm a Christian. This thing that I'm doing, I'm pretty sure I'm not supposed to be doing more importantly, maybe I know that the Bible speaks against this, but I just don't feel bad about it. So our conscience is a God-given gift, but we need to know that our conscience is not infallible. Our conscience can be taught and it can be calibrated. And over time, if we continue to sin, we teach our conscience not to make those warning lights go off. The volume is turned down until the point where we might see our consciences, and that conscience is just turned off, and I don't feel that anymore. So we need to recalibrate our consciences as Christians. The way we do that is by reading God's Word. God's Word never changes, and God's Word tells us what is true. So our conscience is a gift, but it is only a gift in as much as it is aligned with what Scripture says. We cannot operate as Christians based only off of our feelings or how we feel about things. We go to the Bible and what it says, that's what we follow. And then our obedience, through our obedience, our feelings follow that obedience, not the other way around. If you guys have been in our gospel treason study recently, that was one of the recent chapters. Our feelings follow our obedience. So you have to recalibrate your conscience by being in God's word. Also being in community is another thing that helps you. Also sermons like today's. When you reflect on what Jesus Christ has done for us because of our sin, like what he went through because of our sin, and I don't mean to call this person out that had the question, but like, how can I be okay with my sin? I want nothing to do with my sin. I want nothing to do with the things that I've done that have put Jesus Christ on the cross. Recalibrate your conscience to the word of God. Stay in the word. Stay in community. Have it speak into your life. Next question is, uh, this week I had a meeting with a person that prefers the pronoun she slash him. That's interesting. Uh, how do I lovingly interact with this person and still uphold the truth? 
So this is increasingly a challenge, and I need to just explain this to perhaps some of our older people here, and I don't mean to be condescending, but you'd be like, wait, what's happening? What are we even talking about right now? So it is increasingly common in society, starting in colleges. I know of colleges in the country where the first thing you do when you check into your dorm is you put on your dorm room what your pronouns are. Uh, it's increasingly common in, uh, when you are to have an email signature, you're to put your, your pronouns on it. And then uh, when you start off a work meeting, particularly a Zoom meeting, you usually start off with saying, here's my pronouns of choice. And people are like, what are you talking about? It is the belief that uh, gender is fluid and that it's not binary, binary meaning man or woman, and that there are multiple genders that have, not only you can switch your gender from man to woman if you so personally identify with that, but also to be uh, non-binary, to have other genders in your pronouns of choice, Z, Zim, or that kind of thing. Um, and I could explain more, but it'll take too long. The question is, what do I do when I'm interacting with somebody who's like, hey, call me this, but they're this. This is a great question, and I think one in which you're going to have to be increasingly aware of. In the same way that you're going to get asked the question, hey, I've got a friend from work, hey, I've got my sister, hey, I've got my brother, you know, my family, um, and they've invited me to go to their gay wedding. You're going to be faced with these kind of ethical situations all the time. The question is, how do I respond? On this question of pronouns, this is a, this is a bit of a tricky question. The reason why is because there's no, what the Bible is very clear on is that God created man and woman. That was God's creation. He created them accordingly. And outside of a very small group of people that are identified as intersexed because of some chromosomal abnormalities in their body, outside of that very small anomaly, all other situations in which we're dealing with today are people who personally, internally, subjectively, for whatever influential reasons, are saying, I identify as something other than my anatomy and or what my declaration is be when I was, when I was first born. And I'm asking you to now respect that. So the Bible does speak specifically about God creating man and woman. God also speaks very clearly about respecting people and loving them, being kind to them. The question is, am I participating in a false narrative by speaking to them with the pronouns that they choose? And quite honestly, Christians will disagree on this. Some Christians will say, for the sake of peace in the long-term relationship to get to gospel conversations, the pronouns is not where I'm going to make a hill to die on. Others, Christians' consciences feel like the pronouns, if I say those pronouns, which are not accurate to who they actually are as God created them, I am facilitating in and participating in the lie that they're asking me to participate in, and I'm therefore a supporting actor or actress in their alternative universe, and I don't want to have that on my conscience. What I'm saying here is a more practical way to kind of think through this, and by the way, those are both practical. Some would say yes, some would say no, is that you're going to have to ask the question to this person, what do they already know of you as to what you believe and why you believe that? What do they know about you as far as how you've acted and interacted with them relationally? Is this sum of your relationship as to whether or not you love them or not found in whether or not you use the pronouns? And quite honestly, no matter how loving you are, for some people in response back to you, they're going to say yes to that. And you're going to have to make that decision based upon that situation, should I or should I not participate in that? I think there's a place by which you would say, that's not something I agree with, but it's not something right now in this conversation I want to die on because I'd rather have a different conversation with you for long-term purposes. Others can say, listen, I will lose my job. I will lose my friendships. I will lose my family relationships. If I participate in any level of that, I don't care. I, will, I just won't do that. I don't care if I lose those relationships because I feel like this is the choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I want you to kind of see it's a conscience issue applied to the use of pronouns and how much you are facilitating it and or I disagree with it, but I'm not going to every time you bring up something, I disagree with, say, I disagree with that. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. I just want you to know I'm disagreeing with that unless you think I'm okay with that because that can be sometimes how it's received by people and how to respond. So that would be my answer. Ronald? All right. <clears throat> I was a... I was in a Christian godly relationship. The breakup was hard because I didn't see it coming. What is a helpful reminder for someone going through this? I think about my own salvation story. I think about uh, the reality that ninth grade or so, got in a bad breakup, 
thought the world was ending, as most ninth graders do when that happens. And, uh, and God used that to, to redeem that time, and that's how I got saved. That was a big part of it. And I say all that to say, in a, in a Romans 8 kind of way, God is working all things for your good. Even though it was unexpected on your end, it was not unexpected on God's end. God saw that, and as a good and loving father, uh, he ordained it, that that would happen, to draw you to him in some way, shape, or form, perhaps the other person that you were dating. Uh, we can't know everything on this side of life, but we can trust his promises and what he's given us. And so this, whether it be this or any other unexpected challenge, trial, or tribulation, God is working good in it. And our hope is not in the circumstances coming out in a, a joyful or happy way, but in the promises ultimately that God has given us that we will be forever joyful and, and uh, with pleasures forevermore at his right hand, as Psalm 16 says, uh, uh, in heaven in the future. And so um, God is working good in this life, yes, um, and, and even through the most difficult of circumstances, even through the sermon today as we we're reading the scourging of Jesus Christ, the most horrific and horrendous and gruesome thing we can think of, God was working our salvation through that. Can I jump off of that with a different question, and then you end us with your final question? The question came up, I don't know where it is now, but the question about if God loves us, why does he allow suffering? Something like that's on that question there. Um, so, yeah, it's a question about suffering. I want to read to you Romans chapter 5. Uh, I want you to listen what Paul tells the Christians. He says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So peace is the byproduct of having been justified. Justification happens by faith. Through him, meaning because of through Jesus Christ, we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we're rejoicing in the hope. Our hope is in the glory of God. Not only that, now this is where it gets intriguing. Verse three, we rejoice in our sufferings that sounds bizarre. Why? He says, knowing that suffering produces endurance. It's a product. It produces endurance. And endurance produces character. So just to be clear, suffering does not mean you don't have hope. That's already been discussed. Suffering does not mean you don't have peace. That's being discussed. But suffering is the reality of living in this book world and what it produces in you it produce, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we are still weak at the right time, Christ died, for the un, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will surely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Whether it be relationship breakups can be hard, whether it be losing a job can be hard, the diagnosis of cancer can be hard, a life-altering disease that has no cure in sight that can be hard, your own emotional volatility and the difficulty of processing life, tempted regularly with anxiety can be hard. God loves you. There is hope in his son Christ, and he is producing something in you through that hallway of suffering. It's not in vain. He cares for you. Last question from Chris. In the spirit of helping our sisters in Christ, how should us as men think through our own modesty? I appreciate this question because it's flipped the other way. Um, it's flipped in a way that we don't usually think about. Um, I also appreciate the name being signed. Chris Noel, thank you for that. Oh, Chris, maybe, maybe be a leader. Man. Chris, you stand up. Everybody's known to you, Chris Noel. <laughs> and, look, <laughs> and look at what he's wearing. Um, <clears throat> okay, so speaking of modesty, the way we want to think through modesty is we are serving other people around us. So we are laying down our freedoms. We're laying down our liberties in Christ to be able to serve those that are around us. This got very personal for me a couple months ago. I had um, one of our female attenders approach me and say, Chris, I'd really prefer you not wear shorts during the worship service because it's distracting. I don't wear shorts anymore during the worship service. Um, this is news to Eric. Uh, now, do I wish that I would have been aware of that without putting that person on the spot and 
not forcing them, but they, they had to come tell me that? Absolutely. I wish that I would have had the maturity to realize that and to think about that, think of ways that I could serve my sisters in the church by doing that, but I didn't. However, I am extremely thankful for that sister coming to me and having that conversation with me. And absolutely, like, my shorts aren't that important to me. If I can serve you in that way, sure, I'll wear pants. It's no problem. So, again, modesty is not about, like, what can I wear? I want to wear what I want to wear, and no one should have a problem with that. No, it's how can I serve those around me by laying aside my liberties and freedoms so I can love them in that way? It's clothes. Who cares? I would say it's also sometimes immodesty is, is, speaks to your insecurity, men or women, that you want to be identified for something. It can be your fitness, can be your body parts, whatever that is. And it says you really are thinking more about yourself and what others will think of you in light of what you hope others will th say about you versus thinking about others. And so I think it's a good, it's a great answer about not really thinking about others in a good way versus a bad way. Notice my insecurity makes you think of others, what they think of me. But in Christianity, I think of others more important than me. And I want to, not that I'm at the mercy of everybody's fashion preferences, but I want to make sure that I'm not causing someone to stumble. And I do think that's the problem with immodesty is it takes away mystery. Uh, I know more about people and what they look like in their bedroom, naked, than I wish any of us ever knew. But they've taken away that mystery because of how much they've revealed about themselves, physically, man or woman. And that's really quite sad for their spouse, both present or in the future. There should be something sacred and special about that relationship that they have that's for them to enjoy, not for others of us to speculate and imagine.